and welcome to the Gatherings uh, Sunday service. We're streaming live this morning, and I'm just going to thank you guys all for joining us. Um, if you're new here, if you, if you haven't joined us either physically or in this new quarantine life of uh, remote stream services, go ahead and uh, we've got a number that you can text. There should be a number on the screen right now. You can text the word welcome to that number, and that'll connect. Great sandwiches, great coffee. Um, a couple other goodies in the gift bag that we have for you there. So just recommend go ahead and fill that out. And we promise we don't give your number away to anybody. We don't sell it. You're not going to get spam emails or anything like that if you connect with us. Um, and then speaking of connecting with the gathering, if, if you are connected with us and, you know, you call the gathering home and you want to support us, um, you know, we're completely supported just off of you guys. It's uh, our, our parent church doesn't help us. We don't get money from anywhere other than tithing. And if you're
increased in our online giving, so that's that's great to see. We thank you so much. We are just a little bit down. Um, I think uh, I, I read about 20% or so, but uh, man, we know it's it's just uh, everything's different. A lot of you guys aren't aren't really working, and and things are uncertain right now. And just seeing you being willing to to give us that support and and kind of put yourself out there like that, it's it's just amazing. It's a great blessing. So we want to thank you on that. Um, we just want to remind you that, you know, our heart here at The Gathering is to build community. And while that feels a little bit difficult the way things are going right now with these, uh, these just streaming services, we, we are absolutely planning on ramping up and getting back together as soon as uh, basically the authorities tell us it's safe to. Um, you know, we're just trying to, trying to listen to the authorities that have been placed over us. But... Uh, even when our location physically is empty, our heart is in community and in gathering together. So I, I just hope that even as you're gathered together, you know, kind of remotely like this, use the comments and everybody, you know, chat together as if you're out there in the, in the foyer enjoying some coffee together, not just sitting in your pajamas watching us on your, uh, on your internet. Um, but with that being said, I just want to say once again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I want to invite you guys to join us in some worship and singing with our great worship leaders. Thanks.
declare the name of Jesus. His name is so powerful. His name is more powerful than coronavirus. It's more powerful than isolation or loneliness. Just declare the name of Jesus. Declare it over financial worries or unemployment. Declare it over that daughter or son or family member who hasn't been reconciled back to the family. Declare it over that physical ailment. Declare it over that cancer. Just speak his name out. Jesus. 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 Your name is mighty. Your name is powerful. Your name is above all other names in this world. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Well, good morning. Good to have you with us this morning. Thanks for joining live. Uh, this week, I, uh, as we've been, if you've been watching, you know, the various technical difficulties we have. And last Sunday, I think I left my mic off for like two or three minutes. And uh, so, you know, it, uh, it's just one of those things that uh, you, you deal with. I was watching a little bit of, uh, of his last week when it was happened. Um, uh, uh, Vice President Biden had a camp, uh, online campaign or rally, and uh, it was terrible. And I'm not talking politically, I'm just talking the, the, uh, the, the, the connections and the transitions, and it was like, it was painful. And so even, you know, uh, a large political organization trying to put together a smooth um, live presentation can be a, be a challenge. So I don't know that... That in some sense gave me comfort and, um, and no, no, uh, no dig to Biden in any way, but uh, <laughs> I thought, well, okay, it's, it's, it's a challenge for everyone everywhere, and, and that's just kind of the season we're in. And this morning, I want to talk about a really fun topic in light of everything going on. I want to talk about pain and suffering. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's so fun to talk about that. Um, you know, it's just something we just, you know, want to get together over coffee and just really dig deep on. But the reality of, of it is, is that uh, you are either experiencing, and, and certainly we can throw uncertainty into that mix with everything going on. Uh, for me, I know this uncertainty of things uh, can create a lot of anxiety, and, and that can cre create a level of, of suffering and pain that uh, certainly you might say is a first world problem, but, but still it's real. And I think for all of us, either we are, are greatly concerned about the pain and suffering in the world, or we ourselves are experiencing pain and suffering. And so um, this morning, my, my message title is, um, Life Say, and Then You Die. <laughs> my wife asked me not to say it live, so... <laughs> now she's looking at me funny. Um... Uh, but it is, uh, you know, and that quest question mark, you know, and Snoopy's asking that question. What is that? Is that real? Right? You know, the old quote. But the reality of it is, is that uh, this, this topic, honestly, to get honest, can make, it's one that can make me feel small, make me feel a little bit like I'm grasping for straws. Um, because honestly, in our Western culture, uh, we don't have any good process of dealing with it uh, terribly well. And it's kind of like, like the Great Wall of China. 
It's, it, there's no getting around it. Either, as I said, either you're going through pain and suffering or you're going to be going through pain and suffering. And so there's just no way getting around it. And so whether we want to admit it or not, we're all going to face it or are facing it at some point. So, so what do you do with it? What do you do with it? And see, uh, this morning I want to look at, at ways to understand it. And I'm actually going to kind of take it from a 30,000 foot view and, and discuss the, uh, historically and culturally how cultures have helped set up their people to deal and manage and navigate pain and suffering. And, uh, and what I want to do is actually compare our Western secular view and the Eastern, kind of Eastern religious views and then kind of what I want to offer uh, with that is, is the, the idea of authentic Christianity having a much more nuanced view than either of those two, than either of those two views. You see, for almost all of human history, cultures and, and, and obviously um, uh, faith systems, religious systems and cultures have set their people up with a way of navigating and managing pain and suffering. And except in our Western secular view, and when I, when I say secular, I don't mean like, you know, completely secular, secular, but just in our, in our modern uh, worldview, uh, even in, in what you might say Christian circles, uh, anthropologists say that we are, are one of the worst cultures in history at helping our people, our citizens in the West, navigate pain and suffering. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the things that almost all cultures until our, our, our Western culture has done is they have encouraged their people that the meaning of life, because I think if, if, if you're like me, if you can find meaning in something, you can endure it. And almost all cultures historically, and even most cultures currently, except in the West, and we'll get into what that looks like, have helped their people set up a way of dealing with pain and suffering by helping them understand that the meaning to life is not necessarily in this life. That the meaning to life is in the afterworld. And we'll look at some of those different approaches. But it helped people in, in, in this kind of you know, pain and suffering world that we live in and help them navigate and manage uh, that and, and come, come to a place of, of at least being able to en endure it and, and find meaning in it, even if they didn't totally understand it. See, cultural anthropologists say that people in the West are far more traumatized by pain and suffering than any other culture in human history, and actually by most current cultures in human history. Uh, I was reading an article by, a, uh, he's an anthropologist, uh, Pico Iyer. And it's interesting, he's, he was uh, born in England, but he's of Indian descent. Um, and then he, and he married a Japanese woman. I think he's lived in Japan for like 20 years, is what the article said. But, so he studied both East, Eastern and Western uh, worldviews. And so he's a thought, really a thought leader in this. And one of the things he noticed when the tsunami hit Japan here years ago, he was living, I think, in Kyoto. When it hit Japan, he said that, there was far more uh, weeping and lamenting and panic in California, people he knew in California, than there was around his hometown of the people that actually lost loved ones. And that he really articulates that, that, that in one element, that, that we really are not set up very well to deal with pain and suffering. And so what I want to offer you this morning is, is an alternative to our Western view, which even if you grew up in the church, maybe grew up Christian, and I'll critique and get into that a little, you probably didn't really get uh, the, the, uh, the whole picture of how authentic, uh, historic Christianity helped its early uh, followers navigate pain and suffering. You see, we live here in the West, we live in a culture unlike any in history, where for us, the meaning of life is in this life. For almost all of us, the meaning of life really is centered around this life. Now, it doesn't mean that most of us statistically still say we believe in God, but, but as one anthropologist said, uh, it's a thin view of God. 
It's okay to believe in the afterlife. It's okay to maybe believe there is some hope after this life, but we can't know. So even though we maybe have some vague view of God or a higher power or the universe or some larger purpose, it's so thin that he doesn't really give us any reassurance. And so we can't really know. And it's because of that, we pretty much focus our energy and attention and meaning all in this life. All in this life. And so as a result of that, uh, anthropologists, cultural anthropologists have said that, that our Western culture is the worst culture in history at helping its citizens navigate pain and suffering. And so I, I just really, uh, for me, this really struck a chord with everything we've got going on that I just really wanted to address this view and, and help, help us all maybe find a better way to navigate pain and suffering. And, and as we jump into that, I want to just give credit uh, to Tim, Timothy Keller. He's a thought leader, uh, if you can see that book. I uh, got much of my information this morning from him. Uh, he's out of New York. He was a, a pastor for years, but he's kind of a thought leader, a Christian thinker um, in our world. And, um, and he's just got a fabulous book called Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. You see, for us in the West, suffering has no purpose. In, in, in fact, for, for many of us, and, and I know myself included, suffering actually destroys our pursuit and our goals. It doesn't help us. And this is one thing that, that uh, uh, anthropologist Pico Iyer, he said that he once met a Zen-trained um, Zen painter in his 90s who was taught and believed that suffering was so valuable that you should pay for it. That he said suffering had such a positive effect on you that you should be willing to pay for suffering because the benefits were so great. Now, just to clarify, that isn't how we think in the West. Right? That is not how we think. We think just the opposite. So let's compare some worldviews. And I want to I kind of compare some Eastern worldviews and then the West and then kind of come back around. You have, you have really only about a half a dozen worldviews historically on how to navigate pain and suffering. Uh, one of the views is that in the, East, the Eastern uh, really, uh, faith tradition of the karmic approach. If you're with karma... Um, karmic approach is that if you're suffering, it's because you did something in a past life that you're paying for. And likewise, if you're being blessed, you did something good in a past life you're paying for. So all suffering is just under the karmic approach. And, and I'm certainly no expert in, in Eastern religions, but from what, what I can study and understand under the karmic approach, our view, the view is that all suffering is just because you did something in a past life to deserve it. Other cultures say that the meaning of life is, is to go to heaven and be with your loved ones when you die. Others say it's to escape the cycle of reincarnation and to go into eternal bliss. Others say the meaning of life is to escape the illusion of this world and to go into the all soul of the universe, which is, is Buddhism primarily. But what we see from these, these cultural perspectives is that for all of them, the meaning of life was something beyond this life. And so it helped their citizens navigate the pain and suffering of this life because they gave them hope and purpose beyond this life. And whether you believe it or not, they respond, these cultures historically than ours in the West, respond much better and endure much better pain and suffering than we do. There was a famous, uh, I believe he was a leprosy doctor, Paul Brand, I think he was English, started off with working in India with leper colonies and then eventually ended up in the United States working with leper colonies. And that's one of the things he pointed out, that in the West, uh, uh, the, the people he treated had far more comfort, far more uh, options, far more availability to the most modern medicine than any he had seen anywhere in India, yet they were far more traumatized by what they went through than anywhere else he'd seen in the world. And so we see this. We see that from these ex examples that we are not really given very good tools to navigate pain and suffering. And so I want to approach what I, what I call authentic historic Christianity. Now, does it answer all the questions to, about pain and suffering? Well, no, it doesn't. It doesn't answer all, the, pro, uh, all the, the, the nuances around it, but I think you'll find as, as we flesh this out 
that it's much more nuanced, that it, that it has a much more balanced perspective. And, and when compared to our, the Western secular view and the Eastern traditions, I think you'll find that it stands up pretty good to these alternative views. And before I jump into that, I want to kind of address, first of all, if you, especially if you're, if you're listening, you grew up in, in a Christian church uh, here in America, I want to address the, what I call the two prominent views that modern Christi- our modern Christian um, worldview kind of holds. And I, these are my own names, so they're not anything um, official, but I want, to, I want to kind of compare them as distinct from what I call the authentic or historic Christian view. And the first one, I, I call it providence, and there's probably a better name for it, but it's, it's more just this kind of this, it's almost a fatalistic approach. And I know lots of, of, of Christians that I've talked to and worked with people, I've known lots of Christians that have this approach. They go through a t- tragedy, they lose a loved one, and, they, and, they, they, and they, they have this like kind of catchphrase of, well, I guess God must have wanted them more than I did, you know. I guess God wanted to take them home. And it's kind of this, this fatalistic approach to pain and suffering. And I, well, I don't really understand it, but I, I, you know, I, guess, I guess that's just what God wanted. Or there's the other view that I see. Uh, it's what I, what I call the denial view. And, and it's that, the, well, no, you know, there's, you know there's, uh, God wants to only bless us. And, um, you know, if we, if, we, if we do the right thing and pray the right prayers and, and, and live right and all this, that we'll just have this great life and we'll experience all this joy and blessing and we can kind of avoid pain and suffering. And so there's some version of these, at least in my own experience in and around the church, that, that these views kind of hold. But if you, if you notice that the narrative of, of the, the Hebrew Scriptures, which we call our Old Testament, and the Christian Scriptures, especially if you, if you know any of the story arc of the Old Testament, you see that, that it, is much, it is as much about God's will not happening as it is about His will happening. And if you grew up in the church and learned the, 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 the Bible stories of the Old Testament, you see that God created this, this world to be perfect and good and free from evil. He didn't want Adam and Eve to do what they did. They did it. He created then a, a nation out of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who he changed to Israel and created this nation Israel to be his chosen people. And they constantly defied him, constantly rebelled against him. And so you see this narrative even in our own scripture where there's this exchange of back and forth. Now jumping to the early church, if, if, if you know anything about the early church when it started, there is no debate that it swept the Roman Empire. In as little as 200 years, it was arguably the, became the dominant faith tradition in the Roman Empire. And these were giant, massive civilizations of, of historic Greek and Roman civilizations that were, were massive with multiple religious uh, influences and, and very religious, not secular at all, very religious, and yet Christianity swept the field. And some scholars, and not even Christian scholars, in fact, an atheist scholar I was studying, he kind of, he, he goes back and studies that, and he's, he, one of his primary reasons he says that Christianity so swept the field is that it gave the citizens of the Roman Empire a perspective on pain and suffering that their religions did not. That, it, that it, it gave them a place to put and navigate pain and suffering unlike their own traditions didn't. You see, pretty much in, 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 the, in the historic um, tradi- religious traditions, you had the old Stoic philosophers and pretty much th- their, their understanding was you just endure suffering. You know, you do, if you've maybe, if you've read Lord of the Rings or read any of the Norse, uh, the Norse Northern European pagan, you know, it was this, you know, the best thing you can do is die in glorious battle, you know, and, and maybe go to the halls of your fathers, but you just endure pain, you endure suffering, and you just, you just white knuckle it and you stick it out. And this one philosopher, a uh, histor- historian said, he, so the, maybe the, the, the educated Stoics could, could do that, but the average, average everyday people, they couldn't do that. They couldn't bury their infant children, which lots of them did in large quantities, and not weep. It was just unnatural. And so the religion didn't work for them. That Christianity gave them a much better perspective on suffering and pain. 
than these, these ancient religions. So Christianity swept the field. It, it became the dominant faith tradition. And I think if we could get back to this understanding, and in my opinion, more than anything, this area, that if we, if we have followers of Jesus could navigate uh, pain and suffering in an authentic Christian way, and we could do the same thing that it did in the first and second centuries. You see, one of the ways that Christianity offered that, that no other religion offers, it's the only faith tradition that offers a resurrection. It offers not just some eternal bliss, not just some, some you know, nebulous uh, afterlife, after, you know, uh, go to heaven when you die, but it actually offers a resurrection. And most ancient philosophers taught that after you died, you just, you just kind of, you lost your personhood. It's similar, they taught something similar to Buddhism, that, that you just kind of went into the, the all soul of the universe and that you lost your identity and your individuality. That you became part of maybe the great spirit that binds us all together, but you were no longer your conscious self. You, you technically continued to exist, but your personality and your loving relationships were gone. They were gone. And see, and in those faith traditions that if your loving relationships end at death, they end forever. And as we see this, for any of those that have lost loved ones, any of those that lost you know, um, people that we loved and, and we grieved, and you can see how this, this ancient stoicism did not work for them. They just couldn't, could, they couldn't navigate that stoically and just not to show grief. It wasn't natural to our human nature. You see, prior to Jesus, that under, under the ancient religions, you just sucked it up. When there was suffering and pain, you just sucked it up. But Christianity came along and the early Christians, that changed everything. When Jesus came along, it changed everything. You see, authentic Christianity gives people three resources that the ancient culture, cultures didn't have. And honestly, I don't think any current faith tradition has. See, first and foremost, authentic and historic Christianity gives us a God who suffers. It gives us a God who suffers. No other faith tradition has that. That our God in Jesus came and suffered. He knows pain. Our God knows torture. He knows betrayal. He knows loss. He knows uncertainty. He knows any pain and suffering you're going through. He knows it. He's felt it himself. No other faith tradition offers us a God who weeps when we weep, who has suffered and who knows pain. The second thing is that when you believe and follow Jesus, he gives you two things. Oh, I'm sorry. The, 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 the second thing is that that is that he, Jesus, and, and I know this is, this is a, a challenge I've, I've had when I've, I've worked with a lot of people who are experiencing pain and suffering or loss. The natural, some of the times the natural question seems to be, what did I do to deserve this? Right? What did I do for God to do this to me? But you see, we have a God who took our punishment when you're, I want to promise you right now, when you're experiencing pain and suffering, you are not being punished. Jesus took our punishment. Jesus took and paid for our sin on the cross. He died and was punished so that we don't have to be. And He knows what you're going through. Whether, whether you feel that way or not. He knows what you're going through. And the third thing that our, our faith tradition offers, the historic Christianity offers that no other faith traditions offers, is that your future is one of loving relationships. Your future is one of loving relationships. 
beyond what you can even imagine in this life. See, like the, all the other philosophies and ancient uh, religions taught, you don't have to detach yourself from your loved ones. You don't have to keep yourself detached and keep your heart protected from loved ones in some stoic manner. Because one day, those loved ones you will be with again. One day, we will all, those that follow Jesus, will all be living together. Paul said to the church in Corinth, and they were struggling with this, and they were uncertain. And he said this, and, and he wrote it to this, in the second letter in Corinthians. He said that, For we know that this earthly tent we live in, when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earth, earthly body, we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. You see, he's correcting what they believed or were uncertain of that we're going to just go into this nebulous all soul or, or you know, part of the, the cosmos. But he, said, you know, he corrects it. He says, we will not be spirits without bodies. We will put on new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. That there is not just a nebulous go to heaven when we die, but there will actually be a merging of heaven and earth where our earthly fallen and frail bodies will be swallowed up in a resurrection of an eternal body. You see, followers of Jesus don't get, just get a consolation prize in the afterworld. They get a restoration of all things. A restoration of all things. No other faith tradition taught that or teaches that. I believe that's why one of the main reasons the early church became the dominant faith tradition is that there were followers of Jesus out there walking and talking and willing to die claiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. And not just some nebulous, earth-real spirit, but a real body that could eat and drink and walk and talk and be held. So in summary, so the Eastern cultures basically say, accept suffering, it's just. You know, a karmic approach that says, accept suffering, it's just. Though our Western kind of secular tradition, it says that, that suffering is meaningless and it's pointless and just avoid it at all cost. You see, but historic... Christianity gives us, a, gives us a much more nuanced perspective. It teaches that suffering is both evil and unjust. You see, Christianity through the Hebrew and Christian Scripture gives us a narrative that in the beginning, God created a world that was perfect without evil and justice, as I said. That, that indeed, He did not create this world with evil and injustice. You see, but because... Our first parents turned from God. Suffering and evil came into His good and perfect world. It came into it. His good and perfect world. Against His will. And so we're here to deal with it. And what do we do with it? Because it's here, isn't it? It's not going anywhere. No matter how advanced we get in the West and with our modern medicine and our psychology and our, our self-help Statistically and culturally, we are emotionally spiraling out of control. The prescription drug, ep drug epidemic, suicide, all epidemics, all on rampant increase and rise. All of our modern technology, all of our ways of making life better and helping us have seemingly only made this area worse. That we have no coping mechanism for the pain and suffering that we experience. One of the things I, I've studied historically is, is PTSD. And, and from the first kind of recorded war, from the Civil War to the Iraq War, the amount of wounded fell by almost 50%. In other words, the fir uh, First World War had almost 50% less casualties than the, than the um, uh, revolution or the um, Civil War, thank you. Uh, Civil War and likewise World War II had far less than World War I. Likewise, Vietnam had far less 
casualties than World War II, and likewise, Iraq War and Afghanistan War had far more actual casualties than each preceding war. And yet the rate of PTSD has went the reverse. It's doubled. It's doubled. And I think because culturally, we do not give our citizens, our soldiers, as they come back, we don't give them a, a frame of reference to endure suffering. We don't give them a way to understand. We don't bring them back to a culture that knows how to sit with people in suffering and sit with people in pain. We don't know how to comfort people. We just try to give people pat answers or run away from them because we don't know what to do or say. And so this, whether you're enduring pain and suffering right now, this, this topic, I believe, more than any other is addressing an epidemic out there, not just for our soldiers, but for our, our teenagers, for our generations coming up. They are, are the, the, Gen, the, the Gen Z, the generation behind the millennials that are just graduating from high school, are experiencing more anxiety, and yet they have more affluence than any, any generation in history. And no matter how much money we throw at the problems, no matter how much, how much you know, uh, ivory tower experts come at the problem, it just gets worse and worse. It just gets worse and worse. You see, the Eastern worldview says that all suffering is fair. And historic Christianity says no. No. The West says that all suffering is unjust. But it says no to that too. In a certain aspect, we brought this pain and suffering into the world. And if you're like me, if you're honest, most of my pain and suffering has been at my own hands. It's been at my own doing. Almost all of it. <laughs> I was trying to think of something I wasn't guilty of. And almost all of it has been somehow, I've been involved in bringing it about. So in some sense, it is just, but not in all sense. So a question for you. When you experience pain and suffering, do you yell and scream and wail? Or do you sit quietly and wait patient, patiently for God to act? The answer is, according to Jesus, yes <laughs> to both of those. Yes, yes to both of those. You see, unlike any other God out there, our God is a God who suffered. We see Jesus on the cross crying out. We see him in the garden praying and sweating drops of blood and asking for this cup to be taken from him if possible. But he says, nevertheless, Father, your will be done, not mine. We have a God who suffers. Paul told the church in Rome, he said to them, and it's Romans 8, 28, he said, all things work together for good to those who love God. Isaiah, <clears throat> the prophet, 700 years before that, before Jesus said that, that someone is coming along, a comforter, a redeemer, that will be acquainted with our sorrow. See, unlike any other faith tradition, Christianity has a God who suffers and knows suffering. You see, Jesus became mortal and he suffered for us so that one day he can end evil and not end us. You see, he paid for our evil and now he gives us his righteousness. And so he paid the price so that one day forever he can end evil and keep us. You see, I can cry out and I can be sad because I understand that I have a God who knows sorrow. You see, Jesus shows us that contrary to Stoicism, suffering is painful. Right? It's not just suck it up and it's just an illusion and it's just in your head. No, Jesus shows us that it's real, it's painful. But contrary to Buddhism, Jesus says it's real, it's not an illusion. Contrary to the karmic traditions, suffering is unfair. But also contrary to our Western traditions, we can find meaning and growth in suffering. See, Buddhism says accept it. Karma says pay it. Fatalism says endure it. Secularism says avoid it. You know, our Western secular says avoid it or fix it. And they're all partly right. 
They're all partly right. Jesus does say, hey, you, there's things you need to detach. There are things that you love too much in this world that you need to detach your heart from. Sometimes we love our comfort and our money too much. And it gets in the way. Like Buddhists, we do. We do need, to, they're partly right. We need to separate ourselves from, from the, 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 the attachment of, of, of the material and pleasures of this world. And like the karmic traditions, in some sense, we are paying for our sins. And like our secular world, we don't need to accept it. You see how we, we don't need to accept it. And, if, and one of the things I like about our Western view, obviously, is that because of our, our denial or our desire not to accept suffering, we spend a lot of energy trying to fix it. And that's a great thing. I mean, if you look statistically at the amount of humanitarianism that comes out of the West, it's incredible. It's incredible. Maybe on the decline in some sense, but, but historically it's been amazing. I mean, if you, if you compare, even in our, our, our West where, where we have this thin view of God, we still pretty much, even though we've lost the underpinnings of human rights and humanitarianism, the theological underpinnings in it, we still are very humanitarian. And that's a good thing. You see, one of the things that, the, the, you know, in the, in the first, century, first and second centuries when Christianity came along, there weren't hospitals. There was nobody caring for the poor. There weren't orphanages. You see, it's Jesus and his teachings and subsequently the followers that came behind him that gave the world human rights. It gave the world, Jesus and his first followers gave the world human rights. And we are, we are still being blessed by that today in our culture, even though by and large we are considered post-Christian. We want to fix suffering and that's not a bad thing. But you see, authentic Christian faith includes all those worldviews. And yet because of Jesus and the suffering God we have, it transcends them all. It transcends them all. See, in my early years of pastoring, I'd be confused because I would, I would meet with someone and, and they would experience this, this, this time of suffering that brought them closer to God. Then a month later, I'd, I'd run into somebody else or talk to somebody and they'd experience the same suffering, but because of the experience, suffering they experienced, they said they didn't believe in God. And then how could a good God allow this, this bad thing to happen to me? And I, it was very confusing. I mean, you can imagine two people with the same experience saying one of them brought them closer to God, the other one made them further from God or actually deny God exists because how could a good God allow pain and suffering in the world? And it was very confusing to me until I realized that that this is something, when it comes to pain and suffering, we can't be passive in it. You know, and both of them said, well, the suffering made this happen. Well, how can that be if it made, suffering made the opposite things happen? And I realized that it was much more about how we processed suffering and how we viewed it. And that is the huge difference. So we must not be passive in the face of suffering. We must understand and understand whether you, you know, whether you say, well, I don't like the Christian worldview or I, you know, I like, don't like the Eastern, whether you believe the, any of those, you, in this life, you will be forced to take a position on suffering because it will happen to you and you will have to figure out what to do with it. You see, suffering will always make us either better or worse. It, it is, we will not be passive or a neutral in suffering. And when you experience suffering, you will come out of it different. But the difference that you come out as will be largely depend on your view of it. What I'm trying to explain this morning, giving you a nuanced view of understanding how that this, in Christianity, in authentic Christianity, we can yet, we can scream and wail and yet trust and hope. There's, there's two people in history that lived around the same time. I think one was a little, maybe a century later, but I think almost everybody is familiar with, with Charles Darwin. I believe after he buried his second or, or third child, he quit going to church with his family. English, I believe, Anglican. He quit going to church with his family and threw himself into his studies. And, and most of you know from Darwin, we get, we get secular Darwinism and we get, we get um, evolution that, that 
that proved a, a scientific hypothesis for how this world came to be without God. And see, through, I believe, Darwin, and there's not, this is my speculation, but because of Darwin's pain and suffering, he didn't know what to do with it. To rule the need for a God out of the universe. Another gentleman, Horatio Spafford, and you may not have heard of him, but I'll bet you've heard of the song he wrote. It is. Do we lose video? We've lost video. Do we still have audio? Now let us know if we've got audio still. We do? Got audio still? All right. Well, you can hear me if you can't see me. I'm almost done. Sick out. <laughs> Horatio Spafford wrote the famous song, It Is Well With My Soul. And he wrote that after, I believe, burying his wife and two daughters at sea coming over to America. And you see, the two famous people came to two completely different conclusions as the result of suffering. What path will you choose? You cannot be passive in it. According to Tim Keller in his book here, as I mentioned earlier, he gives five, not, he doesn't really call them steps, but five processes to endure and face suffering. And, and now that I've kind of spent, I want to kind of wrap up giving you some tools and some handles for how to face pain and suffering. The first one, he said, is, is weeping. Weeping. To be honest, uh, how it affects you. I know for most of my adult life, with my personality, I, I've pretended, and I realize this because I'm able to stuff it, right? I've pretended that I wasn't too affected by, by pain and suffering. And, um, but just, if, if you're that way, um, just so you know, once you push 45, 50, 55, 60, it, it, you don't have the emotional strength to hold it in anymore. It starts coming out. And it'll come out sideways on you if you don't deal with it. But that was kind of my mode of operating a lot of my, er, in my 20s and 30s and even into my 40s. But he says weeping, it's, in, it's important. If you, if you look at our psalms, if you look at our lamentations, we have whole books in our in Old Testament devoted to the question of suffering and weeping. There's a couple of psalms, the psalms I think 39 and 88, they, 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 many of the psalms, if you've read psalms, they, they start out maybe with a dark and then go high, or maybe they start out high but kind of go dark. There's those two psalms in there. They start dark and they end dark, right? That, that there is this, it's this acceptable way to, to process suffering and say, I don't understand, God, what is going on? This hurts, this is killing me. Weeping, weeping. Be honest with how it affects you. But trust, trusting. Tim Keller says, the, says this, he said, if, if I was one of Jesus' followers and I was standing at the foot of the cross looking up at Jesus dying, I would think to myself, I thought he was the savior of the world. I thought he was our Messiah and King. How can God bring anything good out of this? I don't know if you're honest, think about all of us. If we're standing at the foot of the cross looking up at, at who we thought was going to be the Savior of the world, dying a bloody, violent death at the hands of Romans. And, and, and you're think, I'm, I know I'd be thinking that. Nothing good can come out of this. Nothing good can come out of this. But guess what? God did something good from it. Do you see, we have these little, I know at least for me, I'll, I've got a little thimble brain. Do you think I can understand, right, all the good that might be worked from suffering? And so trust. And all of this requires faith. I'll be honest, this requires faith. There's, Christianity doesn't answer all the questions. It, it, it doesn't, in some areas it does great, some areas it doesn't do great. But I think, as you'll see, that it's, it offers a much better perspective than any, any option out there option out there so trust number three pray pray like job and if you're familiar with the book of job it's it's long it's 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 probably one of the oldest 
manuscripts in the Old Testament, one of the oldest, oldest books. Uh, it's, it's ancient writing. What, but what you see in there, and, and, it, and, it, and its main overarching point is dealing with the uncertainty and the seeming randomness of pain and suffering and seeming unjustness of pain and suffering. But what you see Job doing through the entirety of that is crying and screaming and tearing his clothes, but all of that as a prayer. He isn't holding anything back. He's cursing the day he was born, but he's doing it in an attitude of prayer. And I think for many of us, myself included, we feel like it's like, well, I think these things, right? I'm mad. I'm angry at God. I'm angry. I don't understand, but I, I can't say that to God, like, duh, right? Like, he doesn't know what you're thinking? So pray like Job. Scream, cry, wail. But do it with God. He's big enough to handle it. Wants that from you. And fourthly, reorder your loves. I, I, like the Buddhists say, we, we, and in the West, we love our stuff. Right? We love our material possession. I've, I've been shocked and blessed, honestly, during this coronavirus to see the generosity of, uh, that still exists in our system. I've been incredibly blessed by it. The, the goodness of, of people, the people that love their neighbor over their money. It's, the, it's still out there. It's a good, I've seen a lot of good. I think we're kind of unraveling now and we're all like anxious and, and, and it's kind of derailed, you know, to some degree on the political scene, but ignore that. But reorder your loves, refocus your attention. You probably spend too many hours shining that boat, motorhome, car, right? And you get to go play, play football with your son in the backyard or your daughter, or, you know, or camping, whatever. Right? We need to reorder our loves. We need to, uh, uh, for me, through this season, I have, I have, a, it has, well, I haven't allowed it. I've, it's been forced on me to sift me, sift my, where's my focus? Where's my attention? It's not always where it should have been. And the Lord has used this time of uncertainty to, to re help me reorder my priorities. So we can all come out of pain and suffering better for it if we don't stay passive in it. And number five, hope, hope. See, Paul said to the church in Rome, he said, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that Jesus will reveal later. See, they didn't, they didn't give pat answers. The historic Christians, early church fathers didn't give pat answers to suffering but he said, what we suffer now, and we suffer. Almost all of the early followers of Jesus died violent deaths. Paul, the very author of this book uh, to the Romans, probably was fed the lions or killed by gladiators in, in Rome. Died a violent death. But he says, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. So hope, hope. In uh, C.S. Lewis's incredible book called The Great Divorce, another one I highly recommend, he says, and he, it's, 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 it's hard to understand, but let's face it, right? Pain and suffering isn't, isn't easy. There's no pat answers. There's no easy answers. There's no one size fits all. But he says something really fascinating, C.S. Lewis does in The Great Divorce. He says that, that in the end, in the end, everything bad that ever happened will be sucked up into the glory of your future and make that glory greater. Now, I, I don't know what he's talking about, again, but hope. Right? Hope. To trust and to know that we serve, and in Jesus, you can serve a God that is both sovereign and suffering. That you can serve a God that is both sovereign, all-powerful, but He's suffering. He came into this world that we brought the evil into and defeated it through His death and resurrection. That He took our punishment. We're not, you're not being paid, punished for your suffering. Don't buy that lie. Don't swallow that pill. Nor is it, is, 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 is it just senseless. But hold this intention and hope 
and hope. You see, the end of our, 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 our New Testament, the end of the Christian Scriptures in the book of Revelation, it, it paints this incredible picture of Jesus on a throne. Of Jesus on a throne. Where He is finally and completely sovereign over all. And where He has banished all pain and all suffering. And evil is banished forever. And He says at the end of that, He says, Behold, I make all things new. That the trials you're going through now or will go through in this life will not compare to the joy and glory and hope that Jesus will reveal to us in the afterworld. So have hope. God bless you guys. I want to encourage you this morning. If you have comments or or need prayer, please comment or private <clears throat> message us. If you have my cell phone, it's on the website. You can text me. We want to be with you and, and hold the suffering and tension, but be with you. Know that we want to walk with you in your struggle. And that we don't have to do this alone. Not only does Jesus give Himself as a suffering God, but He gives us each other. That we can bear each other's burdens and that we can suffer with one another. And trust that that suffering will be swallowed up in the glory that Jesus promises. Go out there, be salt and light and healing, energized healing, spirit-energized healing to the world in desperate need of hope, not pat answers, of Jesus, not just another quick solution. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday.